Shalom and welcome. This episode will cover Shem. After the global flood, there would have been an ice age and a stone age. The following video will briefly cover these events. We can see on our planet 25 major features that can now be systematically explained as a consequence of a global flood that erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 30 trillion hydrogen bombs. This theory shows us just how rapidly major mountains form. It explains the coal, oil, and methane deposits, the rapid continental drift, and why the ocean, on the ocean floor there are huge trenches, hundreds of canyons, and tens of thousands of volcanoes. This theory also explains the ice ages, and it gives the primary reason for global warming. It explains the formation of the layered strata and almost all fossils, the frozen mammoths, and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. Surprisingly, it explains the origin of, of comets, of asteroids, and of meteorites. According to Dr. Brown's theory, the ancient world that Noah lived in was very different from the Earth we occupy today. Noah and other pre-flood people probably lived on one very large supercontinent with lush vegetation, inland seas, and major rivers. The mountains were smaller than today's, perhaps 6,000 feet high. Before the flood, about half the Earth's water was in interconnected chambers about 10 miles below the Earth's surface. This formed a thin spherical shell, almost a mile thick, the pressure in the subterranean chamber had been increasing for centuries because the gravity of the sun and moon produced tides in the subterranean water that lifted and lowered the Earth's massive crust twice a day. This tidal pumping added gigantic amounts of, of energy to the subterranean water. This increasing pressure in the subterranean water steadily stretched the crust as a, as a balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began as a microscopic crack that grew in both directions at almost three miles per second. The crack, following the path of least resistance, encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the earth, the overlying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched claw. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. The Bible even gives us a precise date the 600th year of Noah's life on the 17th day of the second month. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. Then it says, and the rain fell. The fountains of water jetted supersonically into and above the atmosphere. The spray from these enormous fountains produced torrential rain such as the earth has never experienced before or after. The supersonic fountains eroded the crumbling rock on both sides of the widening crack. This produced huge volumes of sediments that settled through the floodwaters, trapping and burying plants and animals, forming the fossil record. Eventually, the crack became so wide that the newly exposed floor of the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the Earth like the seam of a baseball. The continental plates, with lubricating water still beneath them, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of approximately 40 to 50 miles per hour, they ran into resistances, and like a runaway crashing train, they compressed, crushed, buckled, and thickened, rising out of the floodwaters. This is why the major mountains are generally parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. Today's major mountains were all pushed up in hours. The hydroplates, in sliding away from the mid-Atlantic ridge opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters retreated. This theory of a massive worldwide catastrophe in antiquity appears to support the biblical story of the deluge in every detail.
Well, we're in the Mount Baker ski area near Mount Baker with Mount Shuxon in the background over here with this beautiful glacier on the top of it. It's absolutely gorgeous. You don't see glaciers very often. They're kind of a unique thing, aren't they? Well, you have to get up in the high mountains today in order to be able to see them. Mm -hmm. And they're much smaller than they used to be. Glaciers used to be much larger than this. How big? Are we talking about just twice that size? Or? In the past, glaciers have covered these mountains down even 3,000 feet lower than we have today. Oh. But even before that, ice sheets, which are basically glaciers on flat terrain, covered major areas of the world. Uh, for example, in North America, the ice sheets extended clear across Canada. They extended down into the United States. So that period of time when that much ice was here, that was the ice age. Hmm. Well, I think most people probably think if you just lower the temperature, you can get an ice age. Well, it doesn't work that way because you got to get the water vapor from somewhere in order to produce the snow. So somewhere you have to have warm temperatures and you have to have cold temperatures. Hmm. And we believe that's what happened during the Ice Age, that at, at, in the past that the oceans were much warmer and the continents were much colder, so that when water vapor that was evaporated out of the ocean was drifted over the cold continents, it then fell out as snow and ice. As an atmospheric scientist, what do you see in the past that would have caused those unique conditions? From my perspective, the Bible really gives us a clue as to what happened that caused the Ice Age. The Genesis flood was a magnificent, catastrophic, high energy event, mm. and it left the oceans warm. And it took about a thousand years for the ocean to cool back down to the temperature that we have today oh. where it's uniform. But during that period of time, particularly right after the Genesis flood when the oceans were the warmest, it produced a tremendous amount of heat and evaporated water into the atmosphere, which then fell as the snow and the ice on the continents forming the Ice Age. So the Genesis flood was actually the cause of the Ice Age. Hmm. Larry, that sounds like we have some very, very unique conditions then. Yes, they were. For example, we know that uh, there were a lot of activity in the ocean. The plates that we are aware of on the surface of the Earth today between those plates, there were cracks where magma came up, hot magma from the mantle, spewed out on the bottom of the oceans and formed a gigantic mountain chain. And that 40,000 mile long mountain chain of hot magma as it cooled, warmed up the ocean. And we have that information from estimates of sea surface temperature from seafloor sediment data. Hmm. And the conventional community believes that as well. So where does the Stone Age fit into the Bible? Was there ever a stone age? Well, right after the flood, Noah couldn't tell his grandson to go to the hardware store and get him a shovel. There were no hardware stores. They had a devastated society, folks. They got off the ark and everything outside is destroyed. You have to totally rebuild civilization. They had a Gilligan's Island situation. You got a bunch of smart people. Well, Gilligan's Island did not have a bunch of smart people, you know, maybe one, but they're on this d devastated planet. So they're going to have to rebuild from scratch, and you're going to make stone tools. Because that's much quicker than digging the iron ore out, smelting it down, and making an iron tool. You know, by the time it takes you three weeks to make your axe, you're going to starve to death, okay? So they're going to make stone tools. And people that are driven out of society are going to travel around in small herds and packs following, uh, following uh, migrating animals, and they don't want to carry 50 pounds worth of stone tools with them. It's quicker to make your stone tools on the job site. You follow the mammoths until you catch up with them, or the buffalo, and then you quick make your tools, kill the buffalo or the mammoth, and you butcher it and leave your tools behind and go on someplace else. And then we today find these stone tools and say, wow, look at this Clovis point. Wow, perfectly shaped, perfectly balanced. This sky is smart. This is an advanced civilization. And then they find another arrowhead, the arrowhead that looks kind of crude, you know, and it's not chipped very smoothly. And they say, wow, this guy's pre-human. You're not quite as smart. You know, maybe you got the whole wrong perspective on that. Maybe the one that looks kind of crude was found by a guy who's in a bigger hurry because the mammoth is getting away, okay? He just doesn't have time to sit there and play with his arrowhead for an hour. <laughs> he wants to go shoot the thing now before it runs off. So it might be an example of how much time they have to spend on it. Not at all an example of their intelligence. So as we can see, after the global flood, there would have been an ice age and a stone age. I have various ages for the earth. 
two old earth ages that place the age of the earth over 100,000 years old, two Midian earth ages that place the age of the earth over 50,000 years old, and two young earth ages that place the age of the earth over 20,000 years old. Now for my personal opinion for the age of the earth, I have three simple theories for an old earth, Midian earth, and a young earth. For an old earth, creation was long before 100,000 years ago, and the flood was around 100,000 years ago. Basically, the post-flood event for an old earth was 100,000 years ago, the mass extinction event. For a Midian earth, creation was long before 20,000 years ago, and the flood was before the last glacial maximum. Basically, the post-flood event for a Midian earth was 20,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum. For a young earth, creation was long before 12,000 years ago, and the flood was before the young Darius. Basically, the post-flood event for a young earth was 12,000 years ago, the young Darius. But within all of my timelines, these two eras remain, the Mesolithic era and the Neolithic era. Therefore, depending on which model people have chosen, I'll begin our journey with Shem and the Mesolithic and the Neolithic since all of the timelines converge to those eras. With that being said, the Mesolithic and the Neolithic were important time periods for human development. But what was the Mesolithic and the Neolithic? According to History.com titled, The Prehistoric Ages, How Humans Lived Before Written Records, it reads, during the Mesolithic period about 10,000 BCE to 8,000 BCE, humans used small stone tools, now also polished and sometimes crafted with points and attached to antlers, bone, or wood to serve as spears and arrows. They often lived nomadically in camps near rivers and other bodies of water. Agriculture was introduced during this period, which led to more permanent settlements and villages. Finally, during the Neolithic period, roughly 8000 BCE to 3000 BCE, ancient humans switched from hunter slash gather mode to agriculture and food production. They domesticated animals and cultivated cereal grain. They used polished hand axes adzids for plowing and tilling the ground and started to settle in the plains. Achievements were made not only in tools, but also in farming, home construction, and art, including pottery, sewing, and weaving. The Mesolithic and the Neolithic are important Stone Age periods in human history because during these periods, humans began to develop rapidly. And shortly after the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, we entered the Copper Age and the Bronze Age, which is the beginning and height of ancient civilizations such as Egypt and Africa, Sumer and Mesopotamia, Greece and the Balkans, the Hittites in Anatolia, the Indus Valley Civilization in South Asia, and the Akkadians in Mesopotamia, as well as many other Bronze Age civilizations all owing their thanks to their ancient ancestors in the Mesolithic and Neolithic era. With that being said, we must ask this important question. What Stone Age population could best represent the earliest descendants of Shem? Basically, what Stone Age population could best represent the ancestors of Semites? Because remember, after the Flood, there would have been an Ice Age and a Stone Age. So what ancient people could best represent these descendants of Shem during the Stone Age? With that being said, there are perfect papers that answer this question. Perhaps the best paper that can help us with this investigation is titled Materials and Language Pre-Semitic Root Structure Change Concomitant with Transition to Agriculture. And it reads, Materials and language have evolved together. Thus, the archaeological dating of materials possibly also dates the words which name them. Analysis of proto-Semitic material terms reveals that materials discovered during the Neolithic are uniquely tree whereas 
biconstinental names were utilized for materials of the Stone Age. This establishes a major transition in pre-Semitic language structure, concomitant with the transition to agriculture. Associations of material names with other words in the Proto-Semitic lexicon reveal the original context of material utilization. In particular, monosyllabic 2C names are associated with a pre-Natufian cultural background more than 16,500 years ago. Various augments introduced during the Natufian and perhaps even more intensively during the early Neolithic were absorbed into the roots, tilling the equilibrium from 2C towards 3C roots and culminating in an agricultural society with strictly tree-constinental language morphology. The Proto-Semitic lexicon is highly suitable for addressing this problem. It postdates the transition to agriculture, yet is not too temporarily distant for the hunter-gatherer lexicon to have been completely forgotten. Possibly then, it contains contributions from both civilizations. Proto-Semitic is based on some of the oldest documents in human history, which leads to reliable reconstructions. Yet it belongs to an era before the rise of the big empires, which mixed up populations and their languages. Proto-Afroasiatic, an older proto-language from which the Afroasiatic language families have evolved, might also be relevant to our discussion. In parallel to developing their communication skills, humans harnessed new materials and developed methods for processing them. The study of the history of chemistry and technology reveals the long and torturous path involved in this endeavor. New materials evidently require new words for describing them. A main goal of the present work is thus to correlate proto-Semitic material names from before and after the transition to agriculture with recent archaeological data. Also shown below, this reveals a major change in linguistic structure, in which biconsonantal 2C material names refer only to materials already known in the Old Stone Age, whereas materials discovered as of the Neolithic have only triconsonantal 3C names. In addition, we discuss the likely characteristic of the hunter-gatherer language that predated the transition, and suggests the schematic model for its development presented in Figure 1. So here is Figure 1, a model for the pre-Semitic language chronology and its relation with the corresponding archaeological periods in the Southern Levant. So during the Upper Paleolithic and the Pre-Natufian and Epi-Paleolithic, this was the geometric Kibran culture. And looking at the pre-Semitic language chronology, we see that it was monosyllabic 2C. During the Natufian period, early Natufian and late Natufian, it was multisyllabic 2C. And during the pre-Pottery Neolithic, PPNA, PPNB, and PPNC, there was a transition. Then we enter the Pottery Neolithic with 3C, and then finally we enter the Chalcolithic, the Copper Age, where we finally get to Proto-Semitic, PS, Proto-Semitic. And again, we're looking at Figure 1, a model for the pre-Semitic language chronology and its relation with the corresponding archaeological periods in the Southern Levant. Proto-Semitic stems from Old Stone Age pre-Semitic populations within the Southern Levant, such as the Kerbian and the Natufian. Prehistoric chronology is geographically independent. In present work, it is based on the prehistory of West Asia and particularly the archaeology of the Levant. The Fertile Crescent, and notably Israel, is one of the more intensively investigated regions archaeologically. By contrast, archaeological studies of Africa, particularly for the pre-Neolithic era discussed herein, are very rudimentary. Thus, archaeological findings from the Levant may be interpreted as representative of their time rather than their precise location. More fundamentally, 
The Levant is unique in hosting the Natufian culture circa 15,000 through 11,700 BP. Table 1. Raw materials in Semitic languages classified according to Rose, the period in Levantine prehistory of their first utilization. This is Table 1, and at the top row, there's materials, then there's Biblical Hebrew, BH, then there's Akkadian, 2C, and 3C. And all Table 1 is showing is the pronunciation of these Semitic words. Again, the Semitic words are under materials, such as water, fire, light, rock, flint, pebble, stone, wet clay, mud, sand, dirt, wood, pole, stick, leather, tendon, clothes, lime, and reeds. And again, the key Semitic languages being used is Biblical Hebrew and Akkadian. And then we have 2C. Now look at the similarities between Biblical Hebrew, Akkadian, and 2C. Remember, 2C is from the pre-Natufian period, the geometric Kerbian period. But 2C is also in the Natufian period, the early Natufian, and the late Natufian. So we can actually see how Semitic languages do indeed come from these old Stone Age populations in the Southern Levant, namely the Kerbian and the Natufian. Again, look at Tusi, which is pre-Natufian and Natufian, and then look at the Akkadian and Biblical Hebrew when it comes to the materials, when it comes to the words and the pronunciations. It all derives from Tusi, old Stone Age populations in the Southern Levant. Again, Kerbian and Natufian. Perhaps this is because these Semitic populations descend from these old Stone Age populations in the Southern Levant, namely, again, the Kerbian and the Natufian. Perhaps these are the ancestors of Semitic populations. Up to the Natufian, the classical nomadic lifestyle of the hunter-gatherer prevailed, more or less as it existed during the Upper Paleolithic. The Natufians contributed a more complex society, with innovations in sedentary and hunting techniques, among other things. They are accredited for introducing the sickle and the bow. It is possible that this was a trigger for the development of a more complex language, Proto-Afro-Asiatic PAA. The transition to agriculture in the Levant began earlier than in other regions of the world. In the pre-pottery Neolithic A, PPNA, 11,700 through 10,500 BP, and it was essentially complete by the pre-pottery Neolithic B, PPNB, 10,500 through 9,000 BP, when large agricultural villages were established. Pottery was introduced during or slightly before the pottery Neolithic, PN, 8,500 through 7,000 BP, whereas the first metal producing installations are from the Calcolithic period, 7,000 through 5,500 BP. Proto Semitic is attributed to this period, and therefore it is the most recent period relevant to our Proto Semitic reconstructions. Nevertheless, we advance one step further in time to discuss Proto West Semitic words as well, which already belong to the Early Bronze Age. Table 1 clearly shows that as of the early Neolithic, all novel materials received 3C names. It appears there are almost no exceptions to this rule. This provides quite convincing evidence for a language morphology change occurring roughly concomitant with the transition to agriculture when a strictly 3C morphology was imposed. As will be demonstrated in detail in the next section, the Stone Ages allow one to connect language with the culture of the people who created it. Indeed, certain associations are meaningful and understandable only in light of the background of their period of inception, whereas at later periods the connection may have been totally forgotten. When implemented based on varied archaeological evidence, this provides an additional useful means of dating words, supporting the supposition that the 2C words in the Proto-Semitic lexicon were coined before, in fact, long before the transition to agriculture.
In this section, we discuss Proto-Semitic and Proto-West Semitic names of materials whose use goes back to the Old Stone Age. These tend to be of 2C morphology and their Stone Ages can consistently be understood as based on the hunter-gatherer way of life. Just as a disclaimer, I'm only going to read one, but check out the paper if you want to read all of the other names, material names, that connect with pre-Neolithic and proto-Semitic. Water and fire have been two basic elements of human survival since the dawn of prehistory. The substance water, proto-Semitic may or my, has a unique and universal 2C name in all Semitic languages. Flint is abundant in the Middle East and North Africa, but not in East Africa, from where modern humans are believed to have originated. The Rock Flint Association is found both in Semitic and Berber, implying knowledge of the natural occurrence of flint within limestone sediments. Thus, the ancestors of Berber and Semitic speakers must have lived in a region where flint was available in Cretaceous rocks. Stones were used for building houses only as of the geometric Kerbian 17,000 through 15,000 BP and the early Natufian circa 15,000 through 13,000 BP. The weak root bin build is attested in all Semitic languages. Thus, it is possibly an extension of the root underlying bin stone. Such a development must have occurred before the bin or bin transition, hence, bin is possibly a Kerbian or Natufian innovation. As of the PPNA, building in stone became widespread, and therefore building was no longer exclusively associated with stone. The first stone buildings were circular, and they dominated architecture throughout the Natufian and PPNA periods. A rather abrupt and complete transition to rectangular houses occurred with the establishment of the larger PPNB villages. A fine example for this transition around 10,500 BP is found in Syria. Thereafter, round houses were seldom constructed. Interestingly, Proto-Semitic contains several 2C roots for round slash circle, such as gul and dir, but none for square. This attests to a special affinity that the hunter-gatherer culture may have had with circular geometry. From the root dir, we have Arabic dar, house, dwelling. Its sole cognate in the Hebrew Bible, dor, Isaiah chapter 38 verse 12, is often interpreted as a circular tent camp. Yet this verse in Isaiah contrasts dor as a symbol of longevity with an ephemeral shepherd's tent. Thus, door must be a stable house, not a tent, and this is likely also the origin of the village names Dor and Indor in Israel. The Akkadian cognate Dor means circular city, wall, a sturdy construction which is not movable like a tent. The common denominator for a reconstructed proto-Semitic Dar'ar would be a house with solid round walls. A reasonable explanation is that this term used to denote the Natufian roundhouse until circa 10,500 BP. As this structure disappeared, the term was borrowed to denote a round wall in East Semitic and a permanent dwelling in West Semitic. Possibly then, Dar dates back to the inception of the round architecture, 16,500 BP, when a new terminology was acquired to differentiate it from the brush huts which prevailed during the Upper Paleolithic. The round house is so characteristic to the Natufian slash PPNA Levant that the above interpretation implies, if correct, that pre-Semitic speakers have occupied the Levant at least as of the Epipaleolithic period. It may thus seem counterintuitive that archaeologically reveals that limestone, Proto-West Semitic, Gur, predated gypsum utilization. Figure 3a shows a 16,500 year old flint blade from a geometric Kerbian site in northern Sinai. 
So this is figure 3, A and B, and at the top A is Gur limestone, which is found only within the Levant. And remember this limestone flint blade was from the geometric Kerbian site in northern Sinai, and this was an ancient culture of people who lived in the Levant. Many of their words and terminology becoming the proto-Semitic languages of the early Bronze Age. And again, all of this originates in the Levant with the Kerbian Natufian cultures, the Stone Age cultures from 16,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. These populations are the predecessors to the Semitic tongue and perhaps even the Semitic people. Subsequently, early Natufians utilized lime plasters in building, as evidenced by the lime kiln found in Hayanum Cave, West Galilee, Israel, 14,000 BP. The fact that both terms connected with the lime processing and utilization, Proto-West Semitic Gur and Proto-Semitic Khur, or 2C is in accord with the archaeological evidence for the early introduction of lime kilns in the early Natufian or even Kerbian periods. As figure 3b shows, there was a clear geographic separation between lime plasters in the Levant and gypsum plasters in Mesopotamia during the PPN. The absence of an East Semitic cognate for lime, proto-West Semitic gur, in this case may be due to the fact that lime was not frequently used in Neolithic Mesopotamia, and this word thus underwent rapid replacement. Earlier suggestions that West Semitic Khur is an Akkadian loanword have recently been rejected, thus leading to better agreement with the archaeological findings of lime kilns in the Levant. The denomination of Quan from Quan parallels the suggested denomination of Ben to build from Ben stone, and hence it should tentatively be assigned to the same period geometric Kerbian slash Natufian. This period, which followed the last glacial maximum, LMG circa 25,000 BP, saw the receding of Lake Lysen that connected the Dead Sea with the Sea of Galilee during the LMG. Reeds might have proliferated in the marshes left behind the drying lake, possibly resulting in increased reed utilization as manifested by the above Stone Age. Another proto-Semitic word for clothes, kisut, is considered to originate from the proto-Semitic word kis, cover, with the feminine ending t. If indeed CVCY roots are an innovation of the Kerbian slash Natufian period, or later, kisut would denote a later type of clothes than sit perhaps a garment that covers the whole body, as opposed to the UP loincloth. During the early Neolithic, flax was domesticated. The first evidence for cultivated flax is from Tel Ramad in Syria, circa 9000 BP. Neolithic Material Names In this section, we discuss materials discovered in the first few millennia following the agricultural revolution and show that their names all have 3C morphology. A. Sun-baked mud bricks were first utilized for building in PPNA sites of the Jordan Valley, Israel, and northern Mesopotamia, Nimric near Mosul, Iraq. It became readily available after PPNA wheat domestication. There are proto-Semitic words for both brick and straw and they already possess 3C structure. It thus appears that the PPNA transition to agriculture correlates with the transition in language structure. D. Pottery. Clay statuettes were produced in the Upper Paleolithic UP long before the manufacture of pottery. In agreement with this finding, Proto-Semitic tin clay has CVC morphology. In the Levant, fired clay vessels that can hold liquids are an innovation of the pottery Neolithic PN 
8,500 through 7,000 BP. Although shards of pottery from Tel Sabi Abiyad, Syria were recently dated to 8,900 BP. E. Metals. Metals present a complex problem, yet they are pivotal in the development of human civilization. Native metallic copper was cold hammered several thousand years before metals were smelted from ores. Objects of native copper from the early PPNB have been unearthed in the northern Fertile Crescent. Other metals found in their metallic state are gold and silver. The oldest gold objects in the Levant were found in a cave in Nahal Ka'an, Israel, where carbon specimens yielded dates between 5,900 and 6,300 BP. Given that metals in prehistory were often recycled, gold certainly belongs to the Proto-Semitic era. The fact that Proto-Semitic is attributed to the 5th millennium BCE whereas the earliest archaeological evidence for Atimini is from the early 3rd millennium can be due to the scarcity of Atimini findings. Thus, all Proto-Semitic materials related to metallurgy are 3C. Conclusion This work has reconstructed Proto-Semitic material names and confronted them with archaeological data of material use on two levels. First, the 2C versus 3C morphology of material names was correlated with the date of their inception. Here a striking correlation was found. All material innovations of the Neolithic period have 3C structure. All 2C material names refer to materials that were utilized from the old stone age onwards. Lime perhaps the last material to be given a 2C name was introduced 16,500 years ago. Although some pre-Neolithic materials such as skin have both 3C and 2C names, which we attribute to a word replacement process, they have all preserved a 2C name. Second, we used associations between 2C roots to project further into the past. Thus, the Zur association between flint and rock suggests a culture in which stone was not used for building. The Dar association between circular stone house and round suggests that the term round was in the lexicon before the first stone houses were built. The Gar association between lime and fire suggests that the term for fire preceded the discovery of lime. Both roundhouse building and lime production are innovations of the geometric Caribbean period from around 16,500 BP. These examples thus consistently point to words of monosyllabic CVC morphology as characterizing languages during the pre kerbian period. Furthermore, words such as Dor, Round, and Gur, Fire may date back to the Upper Paleolithic period, if indeed they gave rise to other CVC nouns almost 17,000 years ago. These considerations lead to the pre-Semitic chronology depicted in figure 1. And just a reminder, figure 1, a model for the pre-Semitic language chronology and its relation with the corresponding archaeological periods in the southern Levant. In the Upper Paleolithic and the pre-Natufian Epipaleolithic, you have the geometric Caribbean culture which was the monosyllabic Tusi, and then in the Natufian period from the early Natufian to the late Natufian, you have the multisyllabic Tusi, and then you have the transition with the pre-pottery Neolithic PPNA, PPNB, and PPNC, and then you have the pottery Neolithic, which is 3C, then finally you have the Chalcolithic, the Copper Age, with Proto-Semitic. Proto-Semites, Proto-Semitic, stems from the old Stone Age cultures in the Southern Levant, the Kerbian Natufian cultures. In addition to the incredible time death suggested by the above analysis, it also indicates that pre-Proto-Semitic speakers may have inhabited the Levant as of the Kerbian period or before. 
This follows because flint is characteristic to West Asia, but not to East Africa. And the round house is archetypal to the Natufian slash PPNA architecture of the Levant. If true, this is a major departure from models which advocate a rather recent Semitic invasion of the Levant. With the evidence connected here, one might envision the transition to the tricontinentalism as a lengthy process which paralleled the increased complexity of the pre-Semitic society culminating in the transition to agriculture. The nomadic hunter-gatherers emerging from the last ice age still retained the 2C slash CVC language morphology of the Upper Paleolithic. As of the geometric Kerbian, certainly by the Natufian society, became increasingly more complex. Permanent stone houses were built to complement the traditional brush huts. Lime was manufactured for hafting weapons and tools, and the sickle was applied extensively for weeping wild cereals. This increased complexity more likely mirrored in the language, which no longer retained its simple morphology. The suggested development, Ben, is interesting because archaeological evidence for the onset of permanent stone house buildings around 16,500 BP suggests that the 3Y root, Ben, emerged after this date. In Proto-Semitic, we already find Ben for stone, so that the augmentation, Ba'un, must have occurred earlier, most likely during the Neolithic. These two events bracket the formation of the three Y root Ben, which could thus be Natufian. If one were to generalize and assume that all three Y roots date from the same period, one would obtain interesting conclusions regarding social developments that are not easily assessed from the archaeological evidence. For example, the Stone Age Quan between read and the verb root to possess suggests that the concept of personal property beyond one's clothes and weapons first emerged in the Natufian period. Another interesting observation corresponds to the two types of clothes. In Proto-Semitic Sit, which has a Stone Age with batoks and might have therefore originally depicted loincloths dating to the Upper Paleolithic by its CVC morphology. Kisut derived from the root kis cover and hence depicting clothes that cover the whole body would be Natufian, judging by its CCY morphology. This hints to a change in dress fashion that occurred over 12,000 years ago, perhaps due to the cold conditions during the Young Darius period. Indeed, some Semitic affixes are widespread in Afroasiatic, and thus they are presumably innovations of the Natufian PPNA period. Augments continued to pile up throughout the Neolithic. The agricultural revolution which began with the PPNA wheat domestication continued with the replacement of hunting by domesticated mammals, the founding of large agricultural villages, the introduction of squared brick houses, and an everlasting quest for new materials. This was apparently accompanied by a revolution in language. Contrary to the implication of the term revolution, it did not occur overnight. The transition to agriculture likely followed many millennia of wild cereal harvesting, pinning of wild animals, experimentation in propagating fig twigs, and the like. Eventually the previous equilibrium was disturbed to the extent of inducing a seemingly spontaneous transition. Analogously, the transition to tree continentalism did not occur overnight. It likely followed many millennia of experimentation in more complex linguistic forms such as various augments. As these became absorbed into the root, the equilibrium between 2C and 3C words was disturbed and the stage was set for a new language structure. The correlations revealed in this study suggests that the transition to agriculture, one of the most dramatic divergences in human lifestyle throughout prehistory, was the final catalyst that brought about a period of dramatic language development, creating within a few thousand years a distinctively different language structure. 
the emerging Neolithic society turned out to be particularly conservative in adhering to the new 3C morphology, which was required for the development of the Templatic grammar characterizing the Semitic languages. By the end of the Neolithic, the biconsonantal languages of our hunter-gatherer predecessors had been completely replaced by the triconsonantal morphology that formed the basis for the languages of the great Semitic civilizations of the ancient Near East. Table A1 Transliteration Proto-Semitic cognates with their Hebrew and Arabic equivalents. So as you can see, Proto-Semitic is very important. Proto means first, first Semitic people, first Semitic language, and Hebrew and Arabic derive from Proto-Semitic or Proto-Semites. Table A1 B. Consonant mapping. The lost Proto-Semitic consonants depicted by blank spaces in the transliteration table were mapped to remaining consonants according to the scheme below. And as you can see again, we have Proto-Semitic, the first Semitic language, first Semitic people, Proto-Semitic, PS, and then we have Hebrew, Aramaic, and Ugaritic. And we can see that Hebrew, Aramaic, and Ugaritic all derive from Proto-Semitic and Proto-Semites. All of this is very important because Proto-Semitic derives from pre-Proto-Semitic and earlier pre-Proto-Semitic. Our main focus was on pre-Proto-Semitic because from these pre-Proto-Semites will come the Proto-Semites. And all terminology in pre-Proto-Semitic evolved in Proto-Semites, their descendants. Then from Proto-Semitic or Proto-Semites, we get all of the Semitic languages and Semitic people groups that we are familiar with today. Now from Proto-Semitic descends West Semitic and East Semitic. The East Semitic would be the Akkadians. Now for the West Semites, they would be your Ethio-Semitic people, the Ethiopians, your Central Semitic, which will come the Arabic, and then your Northwest Semitic, which will be Hebrew, Aramaic, and Ugaritic. But all of these Semitic languages, all of these Semitic people, Hebrews, Aramaic, uh, Arabic, Ugaritic, Ethiosemites, Akkadians even, all of them derive, all of them descend from Proto-Semitic, Proto-Semites. And then Proto-Semites themselves descend from pre-Proto-Semites or pre-Proto-Semitic. The Kirby and Natufian culture in the Levant seems to best represent the Stone Age ancestors of Semites. Basically, the Kirby and Natufian culture are the best representatives for the early descendants of Shem after the flood, since they are the pre-Proto-Semitic population that would lead up to Proto-Semites and then Semites themselves. This would mean that the ancestral homeland of Semites is the Southern Levant. With that being said, what is the Y-DNA chromosomal haplogroup of the Natufians and pre-Proto-Semites? According to the paper titled Paleolithic DNA, from the Caucasus reveals core of West Eurasian ancestry. It reads, such a scenario would also explain the presence of Y chromosome haplogroup E in the Natufians and Levantine farmers, a common link between the Levant and Africa. Also, according to the paper titled, Genetics, Egypt, and History, Interpreting Geographical Patterns of Y Chromosome Variation, it reads, it can be postulated that select M35 carriers, speakers from Africa of a stage of ancestral Semitic, pre-proto-Semitic, entered the Near East. And according to the book, In Hot Pursuit of Language and Prehistory, it reads, the presence of Semitic in the Near East might be explained as follows. Early pre-proto-Semitic speakers would have migrated into Syria-Palestine before the Neolithic being taken by their M35 bearers, specifically M35-78, and adopted by populations bearing M89 lineages. Perhaps at the beginning of this period, or near it, 
marks when pre-Neolithic migrants with haplotype V, E3b, would have established pre-Proto-Semitic in the Levant. The Natufians pre-Proto-Semites best represent the Stone Age ancestors of Semites and the Stone Age descendants of Shem after the Flood. The Natufians pre-Proto-Semites carried Y-DNA haplogroup E, which is found abundantly in the ancient Levant. And the Natufian's homeland is the Levant, the same area of pre-Proto-Semites. With that being said, what ancient population descends directly from the Natufians but is still ancestral to Semites? Where did they live and do they have any cultural elements that reflect ancient Semitic culture. The book titled Early Pastoral Nomadicism and the Settlement of Lower Mesopotamia will perfectly answer this question. It reads, The Pre-Pottery Neolithic B, Complex and the Fertile Crescent. The PPNB cultural manifestations appear to solidify and expand on the earlier Continuous steps towards mixed agriculture that perhaps were begun in the late Epipaleolithic and PPNA. Since its definition at Jericho by Kenyon, the sedentary aspect of the PPNB has been found in a large arc covering Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, Syria, and Turkey. Recognizing the pattern, most archaeologists refer to a Levantine origin for this phenomenon. Moore suggests a concept called the Ancient Levant, which included subsequently all of Syria, western Iraq, most of Jordan, and a portion of northern Saudi Arabia. The researchers at Palmyra refer to PPNB sites there as part of the inland Levant. So here is figure two, Fertile Crescent in relation to the ancient Levant and this is where the PPNA and PPNB and PPNC cultures are located pre-pottery Neolithic all happening within the ancient Levant. The ancient Levant seems to be an important place for the origins of these ancient people groups. After four seasons of excavation at An Gazelle in Jordan the investigators have subdivided the sequence into three specific phases, PPNB 7000 through 6200 BC, PPNC 6200 through 5800 BC, also called Final PPN or PPNB Final, and the PN Neolithic 5800 through 5000 BC sometimes called Late Neolithic. Three major topics, climate, subsistence, and lithic technology, which relate to pastoral nomadicism and can be recognized in the archaeological record, are briefly examined here in light of the revised PPNB slash C record. It seems clear that the PPNB slash C was part of a climactic optimum that declined slowly and terminated in stages during the late 3rd millennium BC. Mel Art speaks of a wetter phase during the early part of that period, which allowed the spread of PPNB culture into more marginal steppe sites such as Bulaukras and Kaolom. Moore has postulated a major shift in vegetation zones between the beginning of the Natufian and the end of the PPNB. Others have suggested that the climate of southern Palestine was wetter during the 7th millennium BC. Economically, according to Bar Yosef, a radical change took place by the beginning of the period. Without clearly stating that the PPNB animals were domesticated, he suggests that a dramatic funnel change was evident at such sites as Miribet, Abu Halira, Bezaman, Jericho, and Abu Gorsh. The evidence of sheep remains at Jericho, found outside their natural habitat, also suggests a concerted conscious manipulation. 
A study of the fauna at Jericho convinced Clutton Brock that domesticated goat and sheep were present by the 8th millennium BC. Moore states that ovicoprids and gazelle were herded by the PPNB. Moore later proposed that only ovicoprids were herded and that the innovation began during the PPNB. Ovicoprids, by the way, are domestic sheep and goats taken together. The earlier levels at Tel Aswad contained a majority of wild animals, but the PPNC domestic ovicoprids were dominant. At Buaukras, contemporary to the last half of the PPNB at Abu Hurira and thus part of the PPNC, the initial final identification suggests that ovicobrid remains predominated and that goat were semi-domesticated. At An Gazelle during the PPNB, herding domestic goats and hunting were equally important. In PPNC, goats were increasingly well represented and hunting declined. The distribution of animal domesticates in the Levant, coupled with other evidence, suggests that the hearth area for much of PPNB animal husbandry may have been in the northern Syrian region just north of Jezera. The spread of PPNC culture over the desert slash steppe suggests the continuation of a mixed subsistence strategy but one that also included some limited sheep slash goat herding. In summary, by 6200 BC, a recognizable PPNC culture had begun to penetrate the more marginal environments of the Near East, both south into the Negev and Sinai, and east of the Levant into Jordan and Saudi Arabia. In each succeeding period, the growing reliance on domestic herd at the expense of farming and hunting and gathering can be documented, thus demonstrating the gradual but inexorable shift to specialized pastoralism. The PPNB, PN, Steep, slash desert cultures of Syria and Iraq. The above discussion can provide a basis for examining similar materials from the Jezera steep of Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, and the deserts of Southeast Syria and Western Iraq. Subsistence patterns clearly define a mixed farming slash hunting gathering strategy, and the lithics are in the larger Levantine PPNB slash C tradition. Several sites in the Jezra were located on the frontiers of the rainfall farming. The influence from the Levantine tradition may extend even to Hasuna. Clayson again found an abundance of domesticated sheep, goats, and cattle and concluded that plant cultivation was of little importance. Examination of those sites of the Jezra suggests that the steep environment was marginal for farming but excellent for expanding herds. To summarize, PPNB populations began to expand into areas of the Near East, often considered marginal to the Fertile Crescent. That expansion has been well documented in the Negev and Sinai, Eastern Jordan, and at Kawam in Syria, where surveys and limited excavations have established some chronological reliability, artifact context, and relevant flana and flora particulars. A number of points suggest a close interaction between those steep and desert sites and the Levantine region itself. Origins of Pastoralism Anthropologists have long debated the definition of pastoral nomadicism. Several recent syntheses have suggested that all pastoral nomads share certain characteristics such as strong legalized kinship and lineage bonds impermanent dwellings, movement to procure pasturage and water for herds and specific relationships to formal states. Thus, pastoral nomadicism seems to stress animal husbandry along pattern migration routes exploiting marginal environments. Developmental models studying pastoral nomadicism have largely focused on historical record, largely because researchers have concluded that a close symbiotic relationship exists between the urban settled peoples and the nomadic peoples. The evidence, however, points toward a new interpretation. 
Pastoral nomadicism began by the end of the 7th millennium BC as populations began to utilize the discovery of animal husbandry in a new and dramatic way. The process can be seen as a third tier step. First, based on funnel material found in the Fertile Crescent, we can conclude that domestic ovicoprids and cattle were present as early as the mid 7th millennium BC. Second, within the steep region, as exemplified by the Jezra site in Kawam, herding was emphasized. That suggestion is based on the location of the sites in a very low rainfall area and the apparent domination of animals over plants in the economy. Third, if domestic animals were known to the inhabitants of the Fertile Crescent and the Steep, and the desert sites are chronologically contemporaneous or interrelated, the latter may represent early pastoral nomads who still exercised a broad spectrum approach for subsistence. The picture of funnel reversal beginning at the PPNC supports these conclusions, as the funnel curves at Abu Harera and elsewhere suggests a reliance on wild gazelle was almost totally replaced by one on domesticated ovicoprids. Two other arguments can buttress the suggestions here. First, the substantial increase in the site numbers and the site sizes in the late PPNB in the desert and steep seems strongly related to complex interactions between the nomads and the settled populations. Animal domestication may be one variable responsible for that increase. Indeed, the Angazel, Jericho, Kilawa, Nahal, Himar link would argue for close interaction of the type suggested from the ethnographic record. Second, the appearance of numerous sites in western Iraq along watercourses that today are dry indicates both climactic amelioration during the PPNB and the ability of a new way of life to sustain human existence in the region. It appears that the late Upper and Epipaleolithic populations in western Iraq and southern Syria largely abandoned the steep and the desert. Therefore, the PPNB slash C sites represent the initial resettlement that pastoral nomadicism made possible. Prehistoric Akkad The sudden appearance of populations without any previous occupational history in the desert and steep raises the question of ethnic and linguistic identity. The Semitic populations identified as Akkadians were pastoral groups who migrated from the western desert or Hamada sometime within a proto-historic Mesopotamian context. No available historical data clarify their condition in the late 4th and early 3rd millennium BC, although some possible contemporary sites have been identified in the desert. The prehistoric occupation pattern, like that of historical time, suggests a strong pastoral Semitic presence interacting with the settled population. The idea that Amorites, Arameans, and Arabs were essentially pastoral nomadic Semitic people who invaded the plain has been largely accepted, perhaps based on the historical data extent for those populations. The crux of the matter in historical terms centers on the Akkadians. The conclusion here is that the title King of Kish, used by rulers by the early dynastic 1 through 2 period, referred to political supremacy over the northern part of the plain, circa 2900 through 2500 BC, a period when Semitic writing was beginning to be recognized as a state instrument for political domination. Since Semitic populations exercised that control, they exhort political and socioeconomic power not only south and to Sumer, but also apparently north along the Euphrates to Mari and beyond. A cultural symbiosis was characteristic of the region, and the early Semitic populations penetrated Mesopotamia through the middle Euphrates Valley. They spread to the region of Kish, Sipra, and Mari, and moved sporadically south. So as we just read, pre-pottery Neolithic A, B, and C cultures descend from Natufians, and these Neolithic cultures were located in the Levant. They were the earliest pastoralist and the first to domesticate sheep and goats. These PPNA, PPNB, and PPNC cultures 
are also ancestral to Semites. In terms of culture, pastoralism started by Neolithic Levantines. And when you study Semitic culture, you realize that pastoralism was an important element among early Semitic populations. The earliest chapters of Genesis even identifies pastoralism with Semites, such as the patriarchs. According to the book titled Animals and Human Society, it reads, Pastoralism featured in the Old Testament of the Bible with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being nomadic pastoralists. And according to the article titled The Pastoral Lifestyle of Abraham and His Family, it reads, Anthropological studies of this period and region suggest the families in these narratives practice a mixed semi-nomadic pastoralism and herdsman husbandry. Because a family could not be entirely supported through shepherd herding, it was necessary to practice local agriculture and trade with those living in more settled communities. Pastoralism cared for sheep and goats to obtain milk and meat, wool and other goods made from animal products such as leather. Donkeys carried loads and camels were especially suited for long-range travel. The patriarchal narratives repeatedly mention the great wealth of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Shepherd herding and animal husbandry were honorable fields of work and could be lucrative, and Abraham's family became very wealthy. With that being said, what is the wide DNA chromosomal haplogroup of pre-pottery Neolithic Levantines, the first pastoralists and agriculturalists who are the ancestors of Semites? According to the paper titled Ancient DNA from Chalcolithic Israel reveals the role of population mixture in cultural transformation. It reads, This finding contrasts with both earlier Neolithic and Epipaleolithic Levantine populations, which were dominated by haplogroup E. And according to the paper titled, Why Chromosome Diversity Characterizes the Gulf of Oman, it reads, the role of the Levant in the Neolithic dispersal of the E3B1-M35 sublineages is supported by the data. And according to the paper titled Y Chromosome E Haplogroups, Their Distribution and Implication to the Origins of Afroasiatic Languages and Pastoralism, it reads, the Proto-Afroasiatic group carrying the E-P2 mutation may have appeared at this point in time and subsequently gave rise to the different major population groups, including current speakers of the Afroasiatic languages and pastoralist populations. So Neolithic Levantine populations were dominated by haplogroup E, and haplogroup E expanded from the Levant. Furthermore, Proto-Afroasiatic populations and pastoralist populations are connected to haplogroup E. These pre-pottery Neolithic Levantines and Proto-Afroasiatic populations and early pastoralist populations are likely all the ancestors of early Semitic populations. With that being said, where is the ancestral homeland of Semites? Where did proto-Semites emerge from, and where do proto-Semites disperse from? The best paper that can answer this question is titled, Bayesian Phylogenetic Analysis of Semitic Languages Identifies an Early Bronze Age Origin of Semitic in the Near East, and it reads, The evolution of languages provides a unique opportunity to study human population history. The origin of Semitic and the nature of dispersals by Semitic-speaking populations are of great importance to our understanding of the ancient history of the Middle East and the Horn of Africa. Semitic populations are associated with the oldest written languages and urban civilizations in the region, which gave rise to some of the world's first major religious and literary traditions. In this study, we employ Bayesian computational 
phylogenetic techniques recently developed in evolutionary biology to analyze semitic lexical data by modeling language evolution and explicitly testing alternative hypothesis of semitic history we implement a related linguistic clock to date language divergences and use epigraphic evidence for the sampling dates of extinct semitic languages to calibrate the rate of language evolution. Our statistical tests of alternative Semitic histories support an initial divergence of Akkadian from ancestral Semitic over competing hypothesis, e.g. an African origin of Semitic. We estimate an early Bronze Age origin for Semitic approximately 5,750 years ago in the Levant and further propose that contemporary Ethiosemitic languages of Africa reflect a single introduction of early Ethiosemitic from Southern Arabia approximately 2,800 years ago. Semitic languages comprise one of the oldest studied language families in the world. Semitic is of particular interest due to its association with the earliest civilizations in Mesopotamia, the Levant, and the Horn of Africa which gave rise to several of the world's first major religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and literary works, e.g. the Akkadian poem, the Epic of Gilgamesh. The importance of Semitic dates back at least 4,350 years before present to ancient Sumer in Mesopotamia, where the Akkadian language replaced Sumerian. From this time forward, archaeological evidence for Semitic among the Hebrews and Phoenicians in the Levant and the Oxmites in the Horn of Africa suggest that Semitic-speaking populations and their languages underwent a complex history of geographical expansion, migration, and diffusion tied to the emergence of the earliest urban civilizations in these regions. The field of Semitic linguists have generally coalesced around a model that places the ancient Mesopotamian language Akkadian as the most basal lineage of Semitic. The standard model divides Semitic into East Semitic, composed of the extinct Akkadian and Ebalite languages, and West Semitic, consisting of all remaining Semitic languages that are distributed from the Levant to the Horn of Africa. West Semitic is in turn divided into South, consisting of Ethiosemitic, Epigraphic South Arabian, and Modern South Arabian and Central Linguistic groups, but the genealogical relationships of the languages within these two groups are poorly defined. In this study, we analyze lexical data from 25 Semitic languages distributed throughout the Middle East and the Horn of Africa using a Bajan phylogenetic method to simultaneously infer genealogical relationships and estimate divergence states of the Semitic languages investigated here. Figure 1 map of Semitic languages and inferred dispersals. The location of all languages sampled in this study, both extinct and extant, are depicted on the map. The map also presents the dispersal of Semitic languages inferred from our study and origin of Afro-Asiatic along the African coast of the Red Sea, supported by comparative analysis, is indicated in red, although other African origins of Afro-Asiatic have been proposed, e.g. Southwest Ethiopia, the assumed location of the divergence of ancestral Semitic from Afro-Asiatic between the African coast of the Red Sea and the Near East is indicated in italics. Semitic dispersals are depicted by arrows colored according to the estimated time of divergence. See colored time scale at top of figure. And important nodes from the phylogeny are placed on the arrows to indicate where and when these divergences occurred. Semitic language divergence dates. In addition to delineating the relationship between different Semitic languages, our phylogenetic analysis provides dates for the divergences of investigated languages. The main estimates of all language divergence times with associated 95% HPDs are depicted in years on the phylogeny in figure 2. Our phylogeny indicates the most basal divergence within Semitic occurred at 5750 YBP HPD 
4,400 through 7,400 YBP, suggesting an origin of Semitic during the Early Bronze Age. This result implies that a hypothetical ancestral language was extant during this period and gave rise to all of the Semitic languages investigated in this study. The deepest four branches of the phylogeny indicate the divergence of East root, West node A, South node E, and Central node B, Semitic. These divergences are nearly coincident with largely overlapping HPDs 3300 through 7400 YPP, suggesting that Semitic underwent a period of rapid diversification upon its origin. Semitic Origins Our analysis of the Semitic language family produced a dated phylogeny that estimates the origin of Semitic at approximately 4,400 through 7,400 YPP. The phylogeny suggests East Semitic, represented by Akkadian in the study, corresponds to the deepest branch. And our log BF tests indicate that Akkadian is the appropriate root for the Semitic languages analyzed here. These results indicate that the ancestor of all Semitic languages in our data set was being spoken in the Near East no earlier than approximately 7,400 YBP after having diverged from Afro-Asiatic in Africa. Our estimate for the origin of Semitic 4,400 through 7,400 YBP predates the first Akkadian inscription in the archaeological record of northern Mesopotamia by approximately 100 through 3,000 years. The city-states of Sumer were established and flourishing in Mesopotamia with their own indigenous languages unrelated to Semitic by approximately 5,400 YBP. So it is unlikely that Akkadian was spoken in Sumer for the entirety of the possibly 3,000 year interval between the origin of Semitic and Akkadian's initial appearance in the archaeological record. Furthermore, Abelite, the closest relative of Akkadian and the only other member of East Semitic, was spoken in the Levant, which is also where some of the oldest West Semitic languages were spoken, Ugaritic, Aramaic, and Ancient Hebrew. The presence of ancient members of the two oldest Semitic groups East and West Semitic in the same region of the Levant, combined with a possible long interval 100 through 3000 years between the origin of Semitic and the appearance of Akkadian and Sumer, suggests a Semitic origin in the Northeast Levant and a later movement of Akkadian eastward into Mesopotamia and Sumer. Semitic Early Dispersals Our Semitic language phylogeny indicates that the initial divergence of ancestral Semitic into East and West Semitic was nearly coincident with the divergence of West Semitic into Central and South Semitic around 5,300 YBP. The short interval between the two divergences and their overlapping HPDs suggests that both divergences may have occurred in the Northeast Levant. The distribution of ancient and modern Central and South Semitic languages is consistent with Central Semitic spreading westward throughout the Levant and South Semitic spreading southward from the Levant eventually reaching Southern Arabia. Central Semitic branch is characterized first by divergence into Arabic and the Levantine languages Aramaic, Hebrew, and Ugaritic at least 3650 YBP and possibly shortly after East and West Semitic diverged. The Levantine languages subsequently diverged into separate lineages by approximately 4050 YBP, but possibly as early as approximately 4400 YBP. The expansion of the Levantine languages of Central Semitic approximately 3650 through 4400 YBP was probably part of the migration process that was definitive of the transition from the early to the Middle Bronze Age in the Levant. Within South Semitic, the early emergence of a South Arabian lineage between approximately 3300 and 6250 YBP may reflect an early Bronze Age expansion of Semitic 
from the Levant southward to the Arabian Desert. The recurrent spread of early Semitic peoples and their languages into the steep and desert lands of the Arabian Peninsula, combined with biblical testimony of early Hebrew subsistence, led us to propose that the earliest West Semitic society may have had a largely pastoralist economy, particularly adapted to such conditions. Conclusion We used Bayesian phylogenetic methods to elucidate the relationships in divergent states of Semitic languages, which we then related to epigraphic and archaeological records to produce a comprehensive hypothesis of Semitic origins and dispersals. After the divergence of ancestral Semitic from Afro-Asiatic in Africa, we estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin, approximately 5,750 YBP in the Levant, followed by an expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. Proto-Semites have their origins in the Levant in 4000 BC. They dispersed from the Levant into Arabia and Mesopotamia in 3750 BC. With that being said, what is the Y-DNA chromosomal haplogroup of Proto-Semites? And just a reminder, we estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin, 5750 YBP, in the Levant, followed by the expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. According to the website EUpedia, titled Haplogroup E1B1B, it reads, E-M34 is the main Middle Eastern variety of E1B1B and is thought to have arrived with the Proto-Semitic people in the Late Copper to Early Bronze Age. And according to Peter Solomon Kovacs, historian and archaeologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, he says, In this group, many of us conclude that haplogroup E is one of the major founding haplogroups of the Semitic people, and that haplogroup E people were the ones who brought proto-Semitic language out of the Afro-Asiatic homeland in Northeast Africa into the Levant and Mesopotamia. And according to haplogroup F-M89 Familypedia, it reads, However, certain subclades of haplogroup E, which commonly occur among all modern populations of Africa, are also closely associated with the distribution of Afro-Asiatic languages, both within Africa and in Southwest Asia which many scholars have taken to support the hypothesis of a Northeast African origin of Afro-Asiatic languages and subsequent colonization of Southwest Asia by haplogroup E3b bearing Proto-Semites. So Proto-Semitic populations carried haplogroup E. Proto-Semites, their origins are in the Levant in 4000 BC and Proto-Semites dispersed from the Levant in 3750 BC. Let's actually visualize this migration of Proto-Semites from the Levant into Mesopotamia and Arabia and Africa. Since all of the best evidence points to the homeland of Proto-Semites in the Levant.
So as you could see from that visual representation, the homeland of Semites, Proto-Semites, is in the Levant. And from the Levant, early Semitic populations like Akkadians will expand from the Levant in 3750 BC into Mesopotamia. With that being said, what is the Y DNA chromosomal haplogroup of early Semites like Akkadians? And again, just to reiterate, according to the Bayesian phylogenetic analysis of Semitic languages, identifies an early Bronze Age origin of Semitic in the Near East, we estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin, approximately 5,750 YBP in the Levant, followed by an expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. Now, according to the paper titled how Eurasia was born, it reads, the most plausible candidates for Semitic remigration to the Fertile Crescent with TMRCAs fitting the arrival of the Akkadians and other early Semitic peoples are certain subclades of both E-V22 and E-V12 with relatively early TMRCAs present in the Middle East could be candidates for such remigration such as E-FGC14382, TMRCA is 2200 BCE, and E-V3262, TMRCA is 2600 BCE. And according to the page titled Haplogroup J1 is definitely not Semitic in origin, it reads, according to the theory, Afro-Asiatic languages spread to Asia via E1b haplogroup, not J1 haplogroup. It is historically known that a ruling elite class of Afro-Asiatic people, Akkadians, Assyrians, etc., also invaded the north of Mesopotamia and brought their Afro-Asiatic languages to the central and northern parts of Mesopotamia during the period of Akkadians and Babylonians. Elite dominance model of E1b1 might be supposed for Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. In this sense, it might be theorized that Sumerian was the main language of ancient Mesopotamians before Afro-Asiatic E1b overwhelmed Mesopotamia, elite dominance model. Therefore, early Semitic populations like the Akkadians would have carried haplogroup E into Mesopotamia. The migration of Semites from the Levant into Mesopotamia actually fits perfectly with the spread of haplogroup E throughout the Middle East. Now all of this makes sense in light of what we know. Proto-Semites and early Semitic populations like Akkadians have haplogroup E. And if you go back to their most recent common ancestors, they would descend from pre-pottery Neolithic Levantines. And they too carried haplogroup E. But if you go even further back to their most recent common ancestors, they would be Natufians, who are pre-Proto-Semites, who also carried haplogroup E. According to writer and historian Jeffrey C., there is no means to saying that E or E1b1b is an African haplogroup. Haplogroups don't have continental markers attached, especially when they originate near continental boundaries. E1b1b originated in Ethiopia roughly 50,000 years ago, but it crossed into the Arabian Peninsula about 22,000 years ago and then became the dominant haplogroup of proto-Semitic and Semitic peoples in Western Asia. It was the dominant haplogroup of the Natufian culture of the Levant in Asia, with the Jewish diaspora starting around 1,900 years ago, E1b1 was carried to multiple parts of Europe and Asia. The total number of carriers in Europe and Asia exceed the numbers of carriers in Africa by far, making it more of a Eurasian haplogroup if any geographic label applies. So as we clearly see over and over again, Proto-Semites, early Semitic peoples, would have carried haplogroup E. This is what most of the geneticists are saying. Now as for the origin of haplogroup E, some geneticists believe haplogroup E originated in Africa, 
but there's also an Asian origin for haplogroup E, or more specifically, haplogroup DE. Frequency of Y-DNA haplogroup E in modern populations and hypothetical migration route from its ancestor, clade DE, in Southwest Asia, the Middle East, Haplogroup E arrived in Africa about 77,000 years ago and diversified in the Horn of Africa. It arrived together with specific West Eurasian alleles and later also diffused into various Paleo-African populations, as well as among ancient North Africans, which were an population indigenous to Northern Africa and distinctly related or ancestral to modern Eurasians. Haplogroup E and DE have an Middle Eastern origin. Haplogroup E migrated into Africa as part of a massive migration of Basal Eurasians, ancestral West Eurasians, and then diffused and diversified within Africa, specifically the Horn of Africa, Northeast Africa. Haplogroup DE next to CF were the Basal Eurasian lineages which expanded from the Middle East. The common ancestral lineage Y-DNA Adam is suggested to have originated somewhere in the Middle East or the Iranian Plateau. Massive Eurasian migration and following admixture created the many different African populations of today and are the reason for the high genetic diversity observed in Sub-Saharan Africa. In other words, modern African peoples, Sub-Saharan Africans, formed from indigenous Paleo-African groups and intrusive Afrasans or Afro-Asiatics, Basal Eurasians and ancient North Africans. Finally, there is the fact why haplogroup E is dominant among non-hunter-gatherers in Africa and is within the Eurasian clade, DE while indigenous African hunter-gatherers belong to haplogroups A, A00, and B. So as we can see, there is a Middle Eastern origin or Southwest Asian origin for haplogroup DE. And of course, in my model, I would say Shem is haplogroup DE. And all of Shem's descendants will carry either the E or the D clade, because remember, haplogroups Paternal haplogroups are passed down from father to son. According to what our haplogroups living DNA explains, the paternal haplogroup relates to your Y chromosome, and since that is the sex determining chromosome for men, it is passed down from father to son. Therefore, the descendants of Shem will either carry E or D clades. Furthermore, an origin for haplogroup DE in the Middle East would fit with recent papers that deal with an Asian origin or an out of Asia origin for mankind, which obviously would fit well with the Ark resting somewhere in the Middle East and mankind expanding from the Middle East to all their respected locations today. The Ark would have likely rested in Mount Judy, which most ancient Jewish Christian and Muslim sources all agree to. But let's return to the main question at the start of the video. What Stone Age population could best represent the earliest descendants of Shem after the Flood? Basically, what Stone Age population could best represent the ancestors of Semites? After the Global Flood, Shem likely migrated from Mount Judy to the Levant. Shem's earliest Stone Age descendants will be Kerbian Natufians, who are pre-Proto-Semites. These people have the earliest terms and sounds for the Semitic language. Furthermore, Kerbian Natufians carried haplogroup E as their paternal marker. From the Kerbian Natufians will come pre-Pottery Neolithic populations whom Proto-Semites would descend from, and pre-Pottery Neolithic Levantines carried Y-DNA haplogroup E as their paternal marker. Since the Kerbian Natufians and Neolithic Levantines are all in the Levant, the homeland of Proto-Semites is also in the Levant. From the Levant, Proto-Semites will expand into Mesopotamia and Arabia, 
and these protosemites would carry Y DNA haplogroup E as their paternal marker, just like their Dentufian and Neolithic Levantine ancestors. Therefore, I conclude that Shem is haplogroup DE, Yap, and the Stone Age population that could best represent the earliest descendants of Shem and the Stone Age population that could best represent the ancestors of Semites would be Natufians, who carried exclusively haplogroup E. With that being said, be blessed and Shalom.